In this episode of the Smart City podcast, I interviewed Irina Anastasiu, who describes herself as a perpetual chameleon. She has a wide and varied background, which is perfect for the smart city space. She has a genuine interest in citizen co-creation, so much so that she has created a framework to nurture this collaborative approach. This approach helps people see people as people and not just organisations that they work for. She believes smart cities should include an integration of the small scale projects with the larger ones and build a shared vision that involves everyone. She has really interesting views about how Australia's societal norms are refreshing and could help shape Australia's leadership in this space. As always, I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. It's the Smart City Podcast, whoa, with smart city experts, here we go. Connecting smart technology, both big and small. Smart cities are making life better for all. Big data, emerging trends, self-driving cars and more. The Smart City Podcast is what you're looking for. Hi, Arena, how are you going? Hi, Zoe, good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's a um, light, nice and hot afternoon in Toowoomba here. Oh, great. So I'm also in Queensland, just sitting here in Brisbane. Uh, yeah. How's the weather down there? Is it raining yet? Not yet. Awesome. Um, well, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, we'll start in the past um, and I'll just yeah, get you to tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. With pleasure. Um, also, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. It's a pleasure and I'm really curious where the discussion now will take us. Um, uh, my background, where I guess I would qualify myself as some kind of perpetual chameleon. I think I've always been interested in, in technology and digital, but I've always taken different paths and been interested in different aspects of it. Um, so at the moment, I'm researching across um, people place technology at the Urban Informatics Lab at QUT here in Brisbane. So I'm really interested in this relationship between um, technology and the city as a, as a spatial, but also a social, a cultural and a political realm. Um, And before that, I used to work as a software engineer and um, designer for user experiences and user interfaces, I guess, in different contexts from IT consultancy, where I worked with larger companies to startups, working for digital agencies, having an own um, small business, um, which was back in Munich and Germany, where I lived before I actually um, moved to Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a logical next step for me, uh, considering that I studied uh, media informatics, which is a bit of a mix between computer science and design. Uh, but also technology management and and communication science. Mm, Cool, cool. Sounds like you've got a really uh, varied background and kind of uh, it all kind of comes together into the smart city space. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, cool. What what sparked your interest in that smart city kind of um, area? There was actually a bit of a coincidence at at that time because I was, that was about seven years ago and I was completing my project for my, my master's studies and I did that project here in Brisbane with the same research lab, working on um, issue reporting apps for the city. Like they're quite, you know, uh, common right now, but seven years ago, that was quite novel. But I was really interested in how these issue maintenance apps could be used to facilitate bidirectional communication between government and citizens. So allowing flow of information, flow of ideas for the city, flow of feedback from both sides, and also seeing it as a tool for actively and proactively making citizens part of the visioning process with regards to the city and the smart city. Um, so after that, I actually I returned to Munich, focusing on on work in industry and other areas of digital. But this project somehow always sat there in the back of my mind, and I was really interested in potentially in turning it into, you know, an own business. Um, but fate had it that I actually came back to Brisbane uh, about two years ago and. Um, back to the same research lab to continue, like pick up where my research um, had stopped at that time. So also looking at strengthening this relationship and and, um, collaboration between government and citizens. Um, But obviously the scope has extended, but I'm still really interested in, you know, the agency of citizens in the smart city and the opportunity that lies for technology within that space. Yeah, cool. Are there any particular technologies that you've come across that you're really interested in exploring? Hmm. I think it's not as much about the uh, kind of novel technology in itself, because we already have, you know, communication channels, um, social media, Twitter, all these different sort of forms of communicating. What I think is really interesting is figuring out how we can actually make these technologies 
uh, better suited because we have noticed, I guess, especially in recent years, that there's a lot of um, really strong debates and a lot of polarization happening online. Um, and this is, you know, a topic that is actually really a challenge also when you look at urban planning and the way we develop our cities, right? There's always conflicting positions. There's always disagreement. And coming to a, a common denominator of finding a solution that actually works for as many people as possible is really challenging. So as part of my research, I, I've been trying to look in how we can translate what is called um, dialectic processes, so processes that focus on negotiating something that is called a, a hard win-win, so where the area of consensus is not limited to the kind of obvious things, but where you actually have a longer kind of um, discussion, a kind of mediated discussion to expand this area of consensus and adapt the project and adapt the idea and elaborate it. So I think this is kind of the area where I see there's a lot that can be improved in terms of uh, engagement um, technology. Oh, that's awesome. Well, let's talk about what you're doing at the moment. So can you give us some um, info or background on some of the projects or things you're working on right now? Um, yeah, sure. So one of the things that I, the point of departure, I guess, um, of my research is really that I, I, found, I found this idea of looking running the city as a business and looking at people as consumers is quite problematic. Um, you know, consumers of services, of, of creating experiences for people, of products, because in some ways that um, undermines the idea of citizens, citizenry and the rights and obligations that come with that and, and you know, the democratic political principles, if you like. Um, so I'm really, I find that this once progressive idea of, you know, human-centered design has gone a bit, has gone mainstream to the point where everything becomes a customer-like relationship and we, we involve people in giving feedback on products for startups and um, big companies, but it's not like they really have decision-making power, right? They don't really have agency. And seeing people as part of the solution rather than someone who feeds into someone else's idea, I think that's not really present at the moment. Much of the time, you know, we see people as passive beneficiaries of some kind of um, technology that has been imposed on them or created by someone else. So I'm really interested in uh, or working on creating a framework within which um, citizens or residents, because there, there has to be a distinction or there can be made a distinction between these two as well, um, are actively contributing to making the city. So I'm interested in the role of technology within this framework, but also um, you know, what kind of different business models can we create to support the kind of activity where, for instance, if you want to contribute, it doesn't have to be that you have to found a business or you don't have to be um, you know, giving up your entire life. How, maybe you can make smaller contributions within a bigger community, for instance. But also hand in hand with that goes um, the aspect of what kind of different you know, governance models would be suited to implement such a framework. And it's not just about me sitting you know, in a little dungeon at university trying to figure out this framework by myself, but I'm trying to um, come up with this framework through co-creation. So actually bringing people together in one room and get them to debate, you know, how could we make this? Trying to provide um, a kind of moderation of the format, but having people actually developing this framework. Yeah, okay. With the framework, who do you see as the um, user of that framework ultimately? Are we talking government? Are we talking, um, you know, city councils or, or that kind of thing or, or everybody um, collaborating together? Well, I, ideally it would be a collaboration across various sectors. Um, this typical model, there's also this typical model, um, the triple helix model of innovation, right, where you have business, government and academia. But I think... The crucial component is to extend this, to have, you know, four strands, five strands, strict strands, where you say it's citizens or we include um, uh, the civic, civil society, so NGOs and activist groups, where we consider nature within the bigger scope. Um, so ideally, we'll try to bring together stakeholders from as many areas of, pos of these um, sectors as possible, but it's not always doable within, you know, various constraints. In terms of users, I think, um, so part of the workshop that I've run to actually come up with this work, um, framework has actually been in collaboration with um, various councils around Brisbane. So I definitely see local government as a potential user of this framework, but I also see um, smaller scale things such as uh, a ward or a neighborhood or, or a certain community that just comes together and, and wants to use it the most important thing for me in this context is the genuine desire to give agency to people and the genuine belief that everyone 
you know, is, can be seen as an asset, as, as someone that brings something to the table. Yeah, really interesting. Can you give us some um, examples of like what, like if I were to read this framework, what's the kind of things that I would, uh, things that, that we're doing now that this framework will change? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess a framework will come with a bit of a, a report on the kinds of challenges um, I encounter during this you know, journey, the kinds of strategies that I, I try to use and whether they worked or not, um, but also a collection of tools that might help the process. So, for instance, one of the things that I found is that obviously working with people from different sectors, it's, it's challenging to do this uh, difficult win-win negotiation, this dialectic process, right? So you, you have to employ mechanisms to have people come together and see each other as people and relate to each other as people. Oftentimes we come to a meeting and we stand behind the organization or we hide somehow or, or we use the, the representativeness or the power of the organization from which we come to argue for what we want, negotiate for what we want. Um, and we argue in favor of the organization that we represent. But sometimes we forget that the common denominator between all of us is actually that we're all you know, citizens and that we all somehow have a stake in this place. So um, the framework will contain a structure of you know, what kind of stakeholders um, can be involved, you know, to which level you can involve them, um, but also these sort of tools, what kind of exercises you could do as an introduction round, for instance, that people, that facilitates people coming together as people, I guess. And does um, technology feed into this framework as well? Um, yeah, I guess the, the component of technology in this space is what I mentioned earlier, to have a complementary online platform or with companion um, tools where you can employ this kind of dialectic process as part of the platform. Um, once you've established an initial relationship, because I think there has to be like a tangle between, you know, a social, the social aspects and the social intervention, if you want to call it, and the technical intervention. And, and as part of, you know, talking to various professionals and doing my own interviews, I, I found that many of them discovered that it, it's really hard to just throw a platform online and, you know, expect that people come and that they will actually use it and find it useful. Yeah. So that social relationship and that trust, what I mentioned earlier, needs to be established first. And once you have that, you can take the discussions into the digital realm and have this sort of mediated way of, of elaborating, I guess. Yeah. Do you think that in Australia we rank pretty high when it comes to smart cities, certain areas, I suppose, or um, overall? I think it's quite doing a ranking is quite difficult because it obviously depends on how, what you define a smart city to be, right? It presupposes that one, there's one singular smart city definition, and whilst you know some people might claim that there's one globally agreed concept, if you look at you know how this, the definition evolved, but also at the different um, smart what we consider what call themselves smart cities around the world. It's been constantly changing, right? It started as a concept that was mainly around economic development and just technology diversification, but around the 80s, late 80s, but then around mid-2000, you know, with the Kyoto Protocol, it became really important to introduce this concept of environmental sustainability. Um, and much of the discussion, um, I, I think, especially in academia, and it's starting to also gain traction in, in, um, in industry, is that... The debate often around smart cities often obfuscates, you know, deep structural problems of the city, like housing precarity, job insecurity, uh, social class and economic um, and digital divides. It's always or oftentimes painted as um, the smart city will bring prosperity to and abundance to, to everyone and equity. But oftentimes the discussion remains superficial about how we could actually do this. And I, if you would ask me, I wouldn't have a very you know, straightforward solution either because I think it's a really wicked problem. But that's why I also think because it's such a wicked problem, we need as many minds as as many positions and perspectives as we can get to actually find a way to, to tackle it. So I think we need to include this social component because I don't believe in patching you know, societal problems with, uh, with a sort of... Um, and technical fix. Yeah. So considering, you know, going back to the fact that there's multiple definitions, if you look at um, different smart cities around the world, in Europe you see, you know, Barcelona or Vienna who are always really highly ranked, whatever, considered really high to according to whichever um, criteria. But, you know, Barcelona has a, has a mayor who comes from like a political activist sort of background. Vienna has a political 
history of, uh, of center-left governance. So they are really focused on, on tackling social issues and see technology somehow secondary. And Europe, you know, Australia shares a Western sort of mindset and, and kind of governance model. And then you have you know, the geographic proximity to, to Asia and also the, economic, the really strong economic link. And then Asia, you know, the level of privatization is much higher than in Europe. The level of technology penetration and the willingness to use technology is much higher. The level of privacy regulation is much lower. So these are very different approaches to smart cities, right? And I think Australia is a bit caught in between. And mm. I think it's a question of which, which direction do we decide to go? Are we going the one way or are we actually going the other way? Or maybe there's actually even, even a third way that we could... Um, that we could approach and what might this way look like. Do you think that um, in Australia we've piloted some smart city concepts or technologies? The kinds of, I think, small-scale interventions um, that I, partic- I personally think are really required to complement the large-scale ones, there are some around Brisbane, I think, and I don't think people would you know, technically directly consider them smart city interventions, um, but I think, you know, the ways, for instance, um, that Nambour has revitalized itself, I think it's really interesting, right? Um, but obviously, there's also like these big flagship projects, such as um, you know, developing Springfield like a, from a ground-up sort of uh, purpose-built sort of city. So, f- for me, it's quite quite tricky to to say. Um, and I think you know, Springfield in that sense, if you if you would put it in the a- Asian realm, if you like, if you want to call it that, I think you know, it's it's doing really well. But I think in the other realm, I think that there's a lot more that could be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You talked a, a lot about integrating across different disciplines. So how do you think we can better in, do this integration across, you know, government, industry, universities and the citizens? Mm-hmm. Um, what I found from, from the kinds of conversations that I had and the kinds of workshops that I've run and by actually working within the local government for, for a period and trying to understand how it works, but also immersing myself in community groups here around Brisbane and, and trying to see how they think, um, I think... The, there's a big challenge that is related to what is called um, frame of reference. Oftentimes, you know, I, I sat within a government agency and I found that the people who were working there were trying to do the best they could within, you know, the, the means that they had, within the space of operation that they had, and had genuinely good intentions. Um, and I found the same, and, you know, the arguments they brought were, were legit. And it's the same with uh, working with, with um, community groups, right? So the, the big barrier and the big challenge here is to, to break people outside this own frame of reference because the problem with these frame of references is, is that even if you have a debate on a very factual sort of level, the things that you consider to be facts are always relative to that frame of reference, right? And everything that doesn't fit in there, often you, know, you consider it um, gibberish. So how can you actually enable people to emerge in different frame of references to understand why people think the way they think, to actually see that, you know, at the end of the day, I do believe that we all kind of share a common desire to, to have a, you know, live in better cities and more just cities and, and more livable cities. Um, I think this is a really big challenge and that goes hand in hand with the fact that oftentimes these partnerships are created around um, economic incentives and we focus a lot on, on the outcomes and how we can negotiate so that everyone kind of gets a piece of this outcome or what they want. But we, sh- we also should, in complement to that, focus a lot more on, on this process, right, what I was mentioning a bit earlier about how can we facilitate encounter, how can we facilitate um, breaking out of these frame of references, because that's the typical problem that you also have, you know, when you're trying to do organizational change um, across departments within an organization. But imagine how challenging that is across an entire city with different interest groups. Um, so focusing more on, on this really difficult win-win on breaking down these frames of references on facilitating this encounter as people rather than as representatives of a certain organization um, and finding these sort of mechanisms and activities and actually be willing to engage in this really challenges and challenging and time-consuming and um, difficult process, I guess, and, and, and lengthy. Mm. Yeah, time-consuming, I agree. Like I think... Um a lot of the time we just want to get things done quickly and we don't want to, um, you know, sit around talking and planning things. Do you think that planning aspect, like, is so important in the smart city space? The the planning is important? Mm, Yeah, yeah. I think it's a bit of a mix. I mean, obviously there's this big trend, you know, towards agile and making things fast and 
breaking things and then uh, adjusting things. I, I, I wouldn't ever think, you know, going back to the waterfall model of doing things is a good idea. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be so clear that we say we want these specific outcomes as much as this is our shared vision and how can we include many more people to actually create that sort of smart city vision because at the moment, you know, it's mainly shaped by, you know, especially during the last 10 years by um, by big corporations and now, you know, government is kind of stepping in and saying, okay, but we don't want to be locked in with this vendor. What can we do? You know, academics have fed into it, but we still haven't developed a shared smart city vision and a shared of vision of how how this technology, what are the boundaries, what are the limits of the technology, where do we want to use it, um, what are the, you know, the ethical norms that we, and standards that we want to ad, uh, adhere to. So I think it's about creating this sort of shared vision, but then taking an agile approach to reach that sort of vision with, instead of um, setting fixed objectives or just saying, uh, we're just going to break things and then whatever happens, well, it doesn't matter, we're going to fix them because we've seen that this doesn't work, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's New Year's resolution was actually to finally admit after years that Facebook, you know, has had a massive impact in the distribution of, or a massive impact on the um, political election in, in the US, right? And that it's actually a media company and not the pure technology company. So we, we need to actually take responsibility for what is happening and making sure that this vision that we're, we're going to, we're, we're not breaking things in the process that at some point might not be, you know, fixable. Definitely. Do you think that Australia can become leaders in smart city tech or smart city concepts or certain aspects of smart city? Um, I think it's quite interesting, actually, because you rephrased the question, um, which I think is really interesting because one of the things that I found really refreshing when I moved to Australia, on the one hand, is the, you know, quite flat social hierarchies. But I also encounter this thing that is called the tall poppy syndrome. And you know, some people are really wary of it and say, uh, but, you know, it's like success envy. But I interpret it as um, being offended that some people might think or behave as if they were better than others, right? So it's a very kind of egalitarian society, if you like, or it's, it's not acceptable to, to be that sort of person that, you know, brags and thinks so highly of themselves and compared to others. And I think that's a really good prerequisite to facilitate these sort of encounters. So in that sense, I think it's, Australia has a really big advantage. Um, but I think, it, you know, this sort of attitude is also seen a bit as backwards. And I think it, it's time to kind of start, you know, putting things on their own, on their head and also put the tall poppy syndrome on its head and see, hey, wait, maybe there's an advantage in, you know, this sort of cultural, um, cultural norm in Australia. And how can we actually make use of that? Because I, I found it really refreshing that I can, talk to anyone from any kind of social background on a much more personal level than I would probably be um, able to do in Germany where I used to live before or even uh, in other countries in Europe where I, where I used to live. So in that sense, I think, you know, Australia could really lead this sort of citizen-led movement and really excel at that. Um, but in terms of this idea of leadership and even technology in that space, I think Australia is facing some of the really big, you know, problems in terms of... Um, you know, drought and water scarcity in terms of, you know, um, uh, deforestation in terms of um, urban sprawl. So these are really big challenges that, you know, we have in your backyard um, that we could tackle. There's big opportunities in terms of, you know, the, the size of the continent and the variety, the geographical variety um, and the climate with lots of sun that we could actually really invest in, in the kinds of renewable energies if there was enough um, support on all kinds of levels. But I, even in that space, I think it could be much more around, instead of focusing to be a leader and how you are going to perceive, be perceived and whether every, someone else thinks you're doing great, rather to focus on actually engaging with the people who are here, um, creating you know, a good basis for people to flourish um, and try to see the addressing and tackling these these problems are creating that sort of process as an end in itself, as a goal in itself, and as something to celebrate in itself rather than comparing yourself to, to someone else. I mean, there's this global trend of cities, you know, perpetually in this sort of rat race, who is better, who is able to attract more, let's call it human capital from somewhere else, when we, we actually forget that there's people who are already living here, right, and who have a right to be involved and who actually bring something to the table if we would be willing to look at that as much as we also look at attracting external ideas and external talent. 
Yeah, looking in our own backyard first. Yeah. What do you think the emerging trends are that people aren't talking about at the moment? I don't know if it's it's really not talking at all. I think it's it used to be a lot on the fringes, but I think it's it's starting to become increasingly prominent, which is this whole topic of co-creation and participatory approaches, um, commons-based uh, business models, you know, small-scale intervention, social innovation, social enterprise. So generally more of these sort of grassroots and collaborative approaches, co-opting people as part of the solution. And the question is really, how can we expand that, right? I, I, I'm not really keen to use the word scale up because that always implies a kind of vertical sort of growth. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be vertical and hierarchical, but it can actually be more horizontal, more networked, um, which is something that obviously, you know, technology is based on. We could try to replicate that in that sense. So I think... There's a few really interesting um, projects around the world. One that I think is really worthwhile looking at is um, the Participatory City project in the UK, which is uh, based on a neighborhood sort of level. And they have all these sort of common base sort of infrastructures like 3D printers, um, you know, all kinds of really advanced cooking technology, sewing machines, uh, you know, coding stations where, where people from the borough can actually come and develop things together they, they help them start businesses, but like on a commons-based sort of concept, they share their plans, they share their knowledge. They create that sort of social capital and intellectual capital along with the sort of economic um, capital. So I think that's a really worthwhile project to kind of look at. And in that space, I think it's, you know, wrong to just dismiss this as, oh, it's just like a sort of small-scale project because considering, you know, the situation that we're in, we need the large-scale sort of components because you cannot you know, have a borough that will redesign the transportation system of an entire city that doesn't work. We still need that sort of, you know, bigger scale um, intervention. But at the same time, these small kinds of things create meaning in people's lives. And if in the smart city as a, as a person, you all just, all you do, I, this is a dystopian view, obviously, right? But still, we don't want to end up people just sitting sitting there and having nothing to do or or not having meaning in their lives or feeling alienated or feeling left behind as, you know, it is kind of a bit of a dangerous trend at the moment, considering recent events, I guess, around the world. So I think it's important to kind of keep track of that and and rebalance perhaps something that came out of balance where you focus on big and shiny objects and big interventions and working with, you know, big businesses and rebalance that to bring in small scale um, network, grassroots, citizen led and actually bring these two together. Yeah, cool. It's been really great to talk to you this afternoon. Um, yeah, I guess I'm looking at it from a different angle, looking from, you know, the small scale um, the small scale projects and things that are making difference, you know, in people's lives rather than just focusing on, you know, the big stuff. I mean, obviously we still need that, but looking at smart cities as kind of an integration of all those things. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. Um, so my last question is, um, how can people connect with you? Uh, probably the easiest is either Twitter or LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn profile and I have a Twitter profile. The Twitter handle is iriphone without E. It's weird because if it's, it's a bit of a uh, word play from iPhone. I used to do a lot of iPhone development early in the days when the, I think, first or second generation iPhones came out and my friends called me Iri Phone or nicknamed me from that, from iPhone, Iri Phone. So, yeah, I stuck to that somehow. Cool. I can put all the uh, links in the show notes anyway um, so people can connect with you. So, yeah, cool. It was really great to talk to you this afternoon. And, yeah, I'm keen to have another chat because um, there's so many different aspects of smart cities, obviously, and diving deep into some of those other ones would be really cool as well. Yes, that's fantastic. I'd be very interested as well. Awesome. It's the Smart City Podcast. Whoa. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart City Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes can be found at thesmartcitypodcast.com. If you have any questions or comments for me or any of my guests, connect with me via email, zoe at thesmartcitypodcast.com or via the socials. I'm on Twitter and Facebook at Smart City Pod. As always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Smart City Podcast is what you're looking for.